Listening Dog Media. World Premier Plays, exclusive to the Pod Play. Manchester, 22nd of July, 1953. And a down on his luck, 37-year-old old blue eyes Frank Sinatra is playing to half-filled theatres on a European tour as his career appears on the wane. As does Frank's marriage to Ava Gardner. He's recently completed a film called From Here to Eternity, a last shot to rekindle his star. It's close to midnight. Outside in a doorway of the Palace Theatre, we see 26-year-old policeman Bobby on the beat from Newton Heath, Harry Cooper, drinking a jug of beer. He's approached by a man in a smart, sharp suit smoking a cigarette. Frank Sinatra, who was played at the theatre that very same evening. He points towards Harry's fast-emptying jug. Can you tell me where I get one of those from, Mac? From the bar inside, friend. Yeah, it's members only, though, I'm afraid. I could sure do with one. Been a tough night. Oh? I'm sorry about that. Are you okay? I think so. I tell you what, I'll finish this and I'll knit back in and I'll fetch us a couple of jugs. How's that sound? I'd really appreciate that, officer. Harry. Harry Cooper. Frank. Frank Sinatra, yeah. No, I know. My wife is a huge fan. She uh, she has all your records. Oh, okay. Was she in the audience tonight? Uh, no, she was, she was at home washing her hair. Frank appears disconsolate. Figures. Looking out into that audience, I don't think she was on her own, man. Like a goddamn funeral. Harry finishes off his beer. Right, I'll go and get us some jugs. Give me a couple of minutes, Frank. Yes, Harry. You sure are a gent. Harry vanishes back inside the theatre. Suddenly, a tramp appears laden down with bags and stands and stares at Frank, who stares right back. For a moment, no one speaks. Then... Can I help you with something, Mac? I know you. Quite possibly. Yeah, that's it. It's all coming back to me now. You're Frank. Sure am. Frankie Valley. Close. The tramp points at Frank's cigarette packet. Can I have one of those? Sure. Here you go. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Valley. You're a gentleman. Frank shakes his head. He notices Harry coming back out of the theatre with two jugs of beer. I gotta go, Mac. My pal's back. Good talking to you. Been extraordinarily uplifting. Yep. Mind how you go, Frank. You're a good man. Hey, we've just been two strangers in the night exchanging glances. Who'd have thought I'd meet Frankie Valley round here? What are the chances, eh? So long. The tramp goes off whistling strangers in the night as Frank listens on with interest. He nods. The old tramp just might have something there. Harry heads over and hands Frank his jug. Here you go, Frank. Get that down, ya. Frank goes into his pocket. What do I owe you, Harry? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, old pal. Not every night I get to buy a bloody legend a drink. Cheers. Harry and Frank toast their jugs. Cheers, Harry. You're a good guy, you really are. So what's your plans tonight, Frank? Are you staying nearby, or...? Yeah, some nice joint called the Midland. Oh, yeah. It's just near the station. I'm off duty shortly. I can walk you up there if you like. Thanks, but I'm not really ready for shut-eye yet, Harry. Too much going on upstairs, if you know what I mean. Say, do you know where I can get some action around here? <laughs> this is Manchester. It's not New York, Frank. I think your idea of action might be a little different to ours. But it's just a few late drinks you're after. I'm sure I could easily accommodate that. I could sure do with the company, Harry. That's if I'm not keeping you from anything. Only my wife Norma's snoring, Frank. Truly being on him, I mean. The two drink and happily chat away in the Manchester night. PC Harry Cooper and Francis Albert Sinatra. Old Blue Eyes himself, finally. Right, pass us your jug if you're done with it, Frank. Take them back inside and we'll get off. Here you go. Sure was some good stuff, that, Harry. 
Frank and Harry make their way through a dark Manchester, lit only by street gas lamps. A city still hardly recovered from the ravages of World War II. Everywhere there sits crumbling tenements, wastelands full of debris and piles of rubble. Remnants of where huge old buildings and warehouses once stood before being destroyed by German bombs. Frank looks on. You guys must have gone through hell, Harry. They certainly did, Frank. Bloody Germans set this place alight. A lot of wooden buildings, as we'll see. You say you could see fires burning 50 miles away. Lit up the night sky red. Hundred dead thousands died. Did you see any action? Too much, mate. I was at Dunkirk, North Africa, Normandy. I went right through. Lost a lot of good pals, that little bastard and his fugs. What about yourself? You in the thick of it too? Frank shakes his head and offers an embarrassing smile. They wouldn't let me in, Harry. As a kid growing up in Hoboken, New Jersey, I got hit in the ear by a bicycle chain. It was a rough neighborhood. The army rejected me and gave me a 4F listing, medical ineligibility. I argued my case and twice I tried to enlist, but it was no good. I tried to do my bit. When I was rejected the second time, I volunteered to join the USO. The USO? The United Service Organizations. I traveled overseas to the front singing for the boys. That was my war, Harry. I was no hero. We all did our bit in our own way, Frank. Some more than others, I'd say. Ah, here we are. Frank and Harry have arrived at Bootle Police Station. Right, I've just got to nip in and sign off my shift. Say, uh, do you want to come inside and say hello to the lads? Sure they'll be over the moon to meet you. Thanks, Harry, but I have a little aversion to cop shops after a few problems back home. They tend to make me nervous. If you don't mind, I'll wait right here. <laughs> No props. Uh, try not to talk to any strangers and stay out of trouble. That shan't be luck. Harry heads into the police station, again leaving Frank alone. He looks around and suddenly hears a familiar voice. Hey! Hello again, Frankie. Small world. The tramp is sat in a doorway across the road. You following me, Mac? No. This is where I live, Frankie. Uh, are you in some sort of trouble? The tramp points to the police station. Just waiting for a friend. Ah, Harry. Hey, he's one of the good bobbies. Seems like a good guy. War hero as well, though he'll never tell you. You don't say. The tramp points behind Frank as Harry re-emerges from the police station in a smart, dark suit and tie. You can ask him yourself. Good evening, PC Cooper, sir. Evening, Trouble. Hope you're not bothering our Frankie. <laughs> hey, hey, me and Frankie, we're already good friends, aren't we, Frankie? Sure are. Say, what's your name? Ah, uh, no. I am Lenny Bobbins at your service, but my friends all call me Lucky Lenny. As you can see from my humble abode under the arches here, it's a nickname that suits me. Will you wrap up warm, Lenny? Taking our Frankie for a nightcap or two. Isn't that right, Frank? Damn straight, Harry. Hey, it's been nice to meet you, Mr. Frankie Valley. Well, good night then. The tramp pulls the cover over himself and snuggles up. Be safe, Lucky. Night, Lenny. There'll be a couple waiting for you in the station in the morning when you wake up, all right? Frank, did he just call you Mr. Frankie Valley? Long story, Harry. So, where are you taking me in this fair city? A special place for the great and the good and magic people, Frank. Such as yourself, mate. Poets, actors, writers, singers, and other creatures of the night. His only wish is to have one more drink before going home. Sounds swell, Harry. Is it far? Yeah, five minutes, no more. It's called the Press Club. You'll love it. Trust me, I'm a policeman. Finally, Frank and Harry arrive outside the Press Club. A simple door in the back street off Dean's Gate. Stood facing them is a smart-suited, huge brute of a man. The doorman, Paddy Ryan. He smiles on seeing Harry. Evening, Harry. How's your luck? You arrested anyone lately? <laughs> no one you'll know, 
Paddy. Well, at least I hope not. Hey, you know me, Harry. I'm one of the good guys. Who's your friend? Frank had been stood further back than Harry. He steps forward into the light of the door. Bloody hell. All the angels and saints in heaven. I don't believe it. Paddy puts his hand out for Frank and the two shake. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Dean Martin, sir. I'm a huge fan. A little old wine drinker, me. It's my pleasure, Paddy. A real treat. Paddy, th this isn't Dean... Harry, it doesn't matter, honestly. Paddy stands aside. Um, in you go, gents. An honour to meet you, Mr. Martin. You too, Paddy, you too. Harry stares with disdain at Paddy and shakes his head. <sighs> we'll have words tomorrow, lad. Dean bloody Martin? Paddy stands shaking his head as Frank and Harry enter into the press club. What greets them is a cigarette-smoke-filled barroom with pockets of tables scattered and everyone appearing to mind their own business. Dean Martin's You Belong To Me is playing on the jukebox, much to Frank's chagrin. Well, you give me a damn break, Dino. Harry points to a small table for two in a far corner. You sit down over there, Frank, and I'll go and get the drinks in. No, let me buy, Harry. I insist. Uh, uh, my guest, my city, my route. A beer, all right? Sure. Thanks, Harry. Frank watches his new friend at the bar and smiles to himself. Harry turns around and waves across, giving Frank the thumbs up. A stranger in the night, in a strange city with a heart of gold. Good old Harry. Harry returns and sits down with two jugs of beer. Here you go, old chum. Down the hatch. Bottoms up, Harry. The two men drink. Frank takes out a cigarette packet and offers one to Harry. Yeah, I don't mind if I do. Cheers, Frank. So, Harry, our mutual friend Lenny the Tramp told me something really interesting before. Hmm. <laughs> Did he now? Go on, what was that then? He spoke about you being a war hero. Can't say I'm surprised. <sighs> Listen, that poaching Lenny drinks would knock out a bloody elephant. Tends to make his imagination go a bit wild from time to time, Frank. Maybe so, but he wasn't making it up, was he? What did you do, Harry? I only did what anyone else would have done, Frank. I was just trying to do my bit. Not everyone, Harry. What happened? <laughs> All right. I never normally speak about this, but seeing as it's you... I'm on it. I really am. It happened in Normandy, 1944. D-Day? No, no. The day after. People never talk about that time, Frank. We'd moved inland, but the Jerry's hadn't gone away. And the thinking at the top brass was that we'd got them on the run. But they were waiting for us. We were up against some of the best. The SS, Fanatics, and our company walked straight into an ambush. Pfft, it was carnage. A lot of my mates cut to pieces right in front of my eyes, Frank. Johnny Roberts, Tommy Dermody, Mick Lindsay, or Collier lads who I'd been with since Dunkirk, lying dead around me. Well, I, I got mad, didn't I? I looked around and the entire company was just being wiped out. And I noticed out the corner of my eye the position of the German machine guns. Somehow, I, I don't know how, I managed to crawl behind them and armed with just grenades and my knife. Well, I saw it. You knocked out the gun single-handed? Harry, what the hell? Yeah, well, yeah. You, you could say that. After the others saw me, they charged the rest of the Jerry's and they bloody scarper, didn't they? Such was the fury amongst the lads. Wouldn't surprise me if they're not still bloody running today. Holy smoke, Harry. What did they award you? Oh, Frank, it was just a piece of metal. It meant nothing. Still doesn't. All in the past now, mate. What was the medal you received, Harry? The Victoria Cross. Frank is open-mouthed. I have no words, Harry. It's in a drawer at home, mate. Behind the socks. It means nothing. I'd give everything. Everything. To speak to my old pals one last time. A tear appears in Harry's eye. 
Frank goes into his pocket, finds a handkerchief and passes it over. You have something in your eye, my friend. <laughs> Cheers, Frank. You're a good lad. Suddenly, a Sinatra song starts up on the jukebox. September song. Why do I think that's something to do with you, Harry? <laughs> no, no, not me. Him. The landlord behind the bar, look. The landlord waves across to Frank and Harry and gives him a thumbs up. Well, it looks like I've got one fan left. A young couple stand to dance and to the beat of the music, they sweep across the floor. The girl smiles over to Frank and mouths, I love you, Frank. <laughs> there you go. You've got two now. Right, I'm off to the bar. Same again, yeah? Unknown to Frank, all eyes in the press club are now upon him. But the unwritten rule in this place is that people's privacy must be respected. Otherwise, you're out. Frank appears mesmerised by the couple dancing. Finally, he replies back to Harry. Yeah, sure. Cheers, Harry. Harry heads back to the bar. Two beers again, please, Joel. And thanks for putting on the song like I asked. And passing on the ten bob to our ginger and Fred over there to have a dance. Any time, Frank. As Harry returns, a voice shouts from the darkness in the other end of the room. You've done yourself well there, mate. The cheeky bastard, I'll... No, please, Harry, leave it. Besides, the chump is right. I have done well for myself. Ava is some gal. Looks like I've blown it, though. Tell me if I'm praying, Frank, but... Things not good on the home front. You, you can tell me to mind my own bloody business, mind. You're not prying, friend. Feels good to talk to you. Not many people I can trust in this goddamn business. You, though, you're solid gold, buddy. So where is she? Is she, she back in the States? Not one for the gossip pages, huh, Harry? Nope, she's filming in London. Well, go and ring her as soon as you can. Don't let arguments fester, Frank. One thing I've learned... Life is far too short, my mate. I'm afraid it's gone beyond a simple phone call, Harry. Trouble is, we're both so alike. Neither will ever back down, and anything is fair game to hurt the other. It's cruel, but it's what we do. We don't have arguments. We have eruptions. It's always better in the cold light of day, Frank. You watch. Things make a lot more sense. I gave everything up for that, Dame. My marriage to Nancy, three beautiful kids, even my career. Everything has been downhill since. The press went all out for me. The gossip columnists, those witches, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. You heard of them, Harry? I no, I can't say I have, Frank. What did they give you trouble? Imagine the witch and the Wizard of Oz spitting out insults like a machine gun. And that's those two. Back home, I am public enemy number one. People believe they're garbage. Well, they say the penny's mightier than the sword. Not my experience, but doesn't mean it's wrong. The work dried up. Directors snubbed me. I, I never even got a call back, never mind a goddamn audition. Hell, I didn't even like myself anymore. Then I started having problems with the voice. A permanently sore throat. The doctors said it was nothing physical, all down to stress. Emotional tension, they called it. I was in purgatory, but all through this, there was Ava. I loved her, she loved me, and despite the rows, the flying glasses, the tantrum, somehow it all kind of, you know, made sense in a mad sort of way. So long as she's by my side and loves me, the world and everything in it can go to hell. That's not healthy. Sounds like you've really been through it, mate. I'm still going through it. It's a Camelot populated by the demons in my head, Harry. I'll be truly honest, I'm not proud of it, but I... I even tried to kill myself because I thought I'd lost her. Took some pills. When I came round, she was by my bed. Ours is a strange kind of love. I've learned if it's possible that you can love somebody too much, and it isn't good. Don't get me wrong, neither of us are angels. I saw dames, she saw guys, but there was always a way back. Why? Because neither of us could exist without the other. 
But now, now I think Ava's found a way, buddy. I think this time I'm truly screwed. I'm sorry to hear all this, Frank. Look, Anne, I know you'll think this is fairy tale stuff, but I think you two will in time sort out whatever's wrong. You just need to talk it all out. Cards on the table time, you know? Leave nothing behind. I've just wrapped on a film from here to eternity. Ava knew the director. She pulled strings. Oh, Frank, that's great. See, she, she must still care for you, mate. I guess so. Wasn't just her, though, I, I have to tell you, Harry. The head of Columbia Pictures is a guy called Harry Cohn. You won't meet a more ruthless, horrible son of a bitch. He was right against me being in the picture. Said I was washed up. So I had a few guys from the old neighborhood whisper a few words in his ear on my behalf. What? Like gangsters? Mafia-like? No such thing, Harry. Just friends. I think... No, I'm sure I nailed the part of Private Maggio. They're even talking about an Oscar nomination. If that happens, I'm right back up there in the stars. And it'll be down to Ava and maybe just a few others. Hmm. It sounds intriguing. Any idea how they did it? I'm not quite sure. I think it was something to do with a horse. I think i best not pray too much, Frank. Me being a policeman and all. Wise guys, my Brit friend. They get things done, and you owe them. What the hell, I had nothing to lose. And as for you, I trust you never to say anything. I've bloody forgotten tomorrow anyway, mate, at this right? I'll tell you what, I'll go and get us another couple of bits. What do you say? It's a deal, Harry. Harry returns to the bar, and Frank watches him go. What the hell? The guys can't hear me here, and most of these limeys don't even know who the hell I am anyway. Same again, Joe. Our friend Frank seems to like our local stuff. Hey, coming up, Harry. Say, you don't think Mr. Sinatra would fancy you going on the old piano, do you? Just a song for the regulars. I, I wouldn't want to impose, though. It's entirely up to him, of course. I can only ask, Harry. On the house, these two, mate. Harry picks up the pints. You're a gentleman, Joe. I will ask, I promise. Harry returns and sits beside Frank once more. Cheers again, Harry. Cheers, Frank. Uh, these are on the house of the landlord. It's a good lad, is that, Joe? Well, that's real swell of him. I think there may be a method in his kindness, though, Frank. Say again? Well, he asked if he'd consider giving his regulars a, uh, a song on the piano, like. No pressure at all, like, all totally down to you, mate. Sure, why not? Would be my honour, Harry. It's the very least I can do after all the hospitality you've shown me. <laughs> well, that's just grand, Frank. Let's drink these and then we'll go and have a word with Joe, yeah? What do you say, partner? I'd say that's just neat, Harry. Just neat. Frank and Harry continue to laugh and chat like they've known each other all their lives. Finally, after finishing another drink... Okay, that's enough Dutch courage. Let's go speak to your buddy about me doing a song on this piano of his. Look, only if you're sure, Frank. Sure am, Harry. Let's go do this. Frank and Harry head to the bar. They're laughing and joking. Obviously nearly three sheets to the wind. Joe? It's uh, my huge pleasure to introduce to you the uh, great Frank Sinatra. Frank and Joe shake hands. <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure, Mr. Sinatra. Just call me Frank. Uh, my pleasure, Frank. Frank here says he'd uh, love to have a tinkle on the piano, didn't you, old chum? Sure did, Harry. Say, where is it, Joe? Uh, it's on the other side of the bar, Frank. You go make yourself comfortable and I'll bring over a few regulars and a couple more drinks on the house for you and Harry here. Appreciate that, Joe. And I insist on paying for these. I really do. Oh, no, your money's no good here, my friend. Around a dozen smiling regulars gather round Frank at the piano. The lights are dim, a smoky-filled atmosphere, and electricity fills the air. Present also is Paddy Ryan, now fully aware who Frank is. Frank glances up. Hi, everyone. This is the biggest audience I've had for a while. Everybody laughs. Harry smiles to himself. It appears his new friend is enjoying life again, just a little bit more, but it's a start. I want to play you a song that I love, 
and means an awful lot to me. It was written for the 1927 musical by a very talented composer called Jerome Kern. It's called Old Man River. For the next four minutes, a magic spell consumes the press club as Frank sings with a diamond voice and heartfelt passion, at times with tears in his eyes. That old man river, he just keeps rolling along. On finishing the last note, there's huge applause. Frank stands and people rush to shake his hand. Harry watches on proud as Paddy Ryan taps him on the arm for his attention. Harry old son, that was amazing. I'm telling you, even Dean couldn't have done that better. <laughs> Cheers, Paddy. I'll be sure to tell Frank. Frank and Harry come together. Frank, no words, mate. That, that was simply magical, mate. Cheers, Harry. There's just one thing I need to do now before calling it a night. Oh, yeah? What's that, then? I'm going to buy you a drink, buddy. Say, what time is it? Joe has returned to behind the bar. He looks at his watch. It's quarter to three, Frank. I think we need one more for the road. Okay, what will it be? Your finest whiskey, and I insist on paying. Two large ones for me and my friend here. Send them up, Joe. After one last drink, Frank and Harry, now totally inebriated, find themselves back on the street. Frank can hardly stand, and Harry is holding him up. If there's any press hanging around the hotel, I'm screwed, Harry, if they see me like this. Don't worry. Give me a key, old son. I know our back entrance. I'll sneak you to your room. Frank desperately searches his pockets, but can't find the key. Hell, Harry, I think I lost it. Uh, right then. Plan B, um, you're staying at ours tonight, and we'll get you back early tomorrow. You okay with that, Frank? Sure I am. You're a real gent, Harry. Frank and Harry cross the road to a black taxi rank. Harry helps him into the back seat and Frank slouches down with a huge daft grin in his face. Harry leans forward towards the driver. Uh, Newton Eve, please, mate. The taxi drives off. Where and what the hell is Newton Heath? <laughs> it's like Chicago without the machine guns, Frank. Good to know. Frank dozes off. The driver is busy looking through his mirror. Um... Is that who I think it is, Governor? Sure is. He's a friend of mine. Oh, I can't wait to tell the wife. I've had Sammy Davis Jr. in my cab. Harry shakes his head. It really has been one of those nights. Finally, they arrive at Harry's house. He pays the driver and they go inside. Nice place, Harry. Cheers, Frank. Tell you what, you get settled on the city and I'll go and get you a pillow and blanket. Harry goes upstairs into his bedroom. His wife, Norma, is fast asleep. Norma, you need to come downstairs. You won't believe who's sleeping in our city. Harry, what on earth are you talking about? You're drunk. Come to bed, love. It's late. No, no, I'm serious. Frank Sinatra is downstairs. Frank Sinatra, I mean tonight, is on our city now, <laughs> right, right now. Oh, of course he is, love. Night, night. Norma goes back to sleep. Harry shrugs his shoulders, collects the pillow and blanket and heads back downstairs. He finds Frank fast asleep. Very gently, he lifts his head, puts the pillow behind it and places the blanket over him. Night, Frank. The next morning, a hungover Frank and Harry awake early and grab a taxi back into Manchester to the Midland Hotel. Norma comes downstairs after they've gone finds the pillow and blanket neatly folded and all of Frank Sinatra records stacked on the table. On top of them is a note. Dear Norma, sorry we never got a chance to meet. I've signed all your... You have darn good taste in music and a real gent for a husband. Lots of love, Frank Sinatra. Oh my God. The taxi drops Frank and Harry off outside the Midland. The two men step out and shake hands. Frank, it's truly been an honor. The honor is truly mine, old pal. You have a passing my way, you get in touch. Promise? I promise. Same goes for you. 
Every Manchester, you nip up to Newton Heath, and we'll put the kettle on. We'll take you up on that. So long, Harry. So long, Frank. Harry watches as Frank heads up the steps into the Midland, just as he reaches halfway. Hey, Frank. Frank turns round. We began strangers in the night, mate. We aren't strangers no more. We certainly aren't. So long, Harry. On the night Frank Sinatra received his Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in From Here to Eternity, a delighted Harry Cooper raised a jug in salute. They would never meet again. World Premier Plays, exclusive to the Pod Play.